Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Continuing our study of prayer. Um, I found myself going back through uh, Dr. John R. Rice's book on prayer, asking and receiving. And as I was reading it, God stopped me and said, Mike, let me give you something out of the word that will be better. And I liked it. I really did. I appreciate the Lord uh, stepping in my life and helping me change course of what I think I should do. God will always show me what he wants me to do and what's right in his sight. And I appreciate my Lord for that. He, God's not afraid of me. I am afraid of him. And uh, I like leaving it that way. Ephesians chapter 6, if you would please, verse 11 the Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to uh, withstand in the evil day that has the word stand in it withstand and having done all to stand stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth having on the breastplate of righteousness these are things that we've all covered and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked Verse 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This Bible is a powerful and alive, sharp, two-edged sword. By the way, the sharpness does not need sharpening by man. Man, never, man has never improved on the Bible. Man has never done that. Usually man corrupts the Bible and it remains corrupted. And then those corruptions go into people's lives and then they have corruptions in their lives. Man does not improve the Bible. However, the Bible does improve man. And all of those who will listen, all of those who will hear, adhere to it, all those who put their trust in it, and all those who will seek it out and believe it. And then he said, verse 18, praying always. And this is the theme we're working on this week. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And then he said, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. <coughs> Excuse me. It's been a couple weeks having bronchitis. I still have stuff breaking up out of my lungs. And uh, I tried singing in the car on the way home yesterday, and I still don't have a very strong voice yet. It's the reason why I haven't sang in a while. Um, but I want you to notice that last part, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. He's given us the role of praying always with prayer and supplication, and then he said, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Watching implies that from the moment you pray until the time God answers the prayer, that there may be an interval of time whereby God says to you during this time, I remembered what you prayed. I wrote it down what you prayed so that I would never forget the things that you've asked me to do. Uh, I'll never forget the first book that I wrote uh, on Bible numbers. I um, originally got the idea from a man who was, if you remember back, he made the Oprah Winfrey circuit and he did was very popular on a lot of secular radio programs and TV programs. Uh, his name was Ivan something or another. But anyway, he wrote a book called The Torah Code. And he said you can by using equidistant letter sequences. You mash all the Hebrew words and letters together. 
and you get this code out of it where it's like if you wrap it around a cylinder and you get some of the letters to line up. So like every 17th letter will spell out a word in Hebrew and that ha in itself has an additional prophecy added to it. And there for a while I listened intently to the man. I don't believe his claims anymore uh, because there's just too many variables involved. But I listened to the man for a while and I, and I remember praying this prayer. I said, God, if your Bible is right, if this King James authorized Bible is right in everything that it says, then God, there ought to be some form of numerical pattern, sequence, something about this word that makes it unique and stand out. And then God, would you show it to me? Now, to my recollection, I prayed that prayer one time. And then almost a year later, I have the, the manuscript in my hand, send it off to the, a company that did self-publishing. And because um, I wanted to be able to con have control over the ownership of the book. I didn't want to sell it to a publishing company. I wanted to own the rights to it. And... Um, Wrote the book out, I got, a, I got a draft of it, and I'm reading it, and I start bawling, I start crying. And I said, God, why did you show me all this? And God then reminded me of a prayer that I had prayed a year ago, and I only did it to my knowledge one time. God, if this Bible is right, there ought to be some numerical significance to it. God, would you show me that? And after a year, I asked God, God, why did you show me this? And God says, because you asked me to. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. God is a God who has a multitude of blessings to give out to his people. You don't have them because you refuse to ask them from God. And I'd rather get them from God than Sam Walton or the government or anything else. I'd rather get them from God. Somebody say amen. Now, here's the part. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. This is going to get into the part now we don't like about prayer and the title of this message is actually a titling it today and pre-titling it for next week because I never did get into the other part but part of the, the message is going to be called prayers waiting and trusting waiting and trusting let me just have a show of hands. How many of you have had God answer a prayer within the same day that you prayed it? God answered a prayer. All over the building. How many of those doggone prayers that you prayed that God made you wait a year or two or five years for them? Hands all over the building. Doesn't that aggravate you a little bit? It does me, John, because I want it done now. Okay, it's, it's just the way I am. So in Matthew chapter 7, here's what our Lord said to do. And he said, he gave us a very simple formula. And you can search through the scriptures all you want to. You can read every verse in the Bible. You can do word searches in here. You can do equidistant letter sequences if you want to. I don't recommend it because I don't think there's anything to it. But you can look for that all you want to. And um, you will find that God, for the most part, when you call upon Him, is going to force you to wait on the answers. Force you to wait on them. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. Ask and it shall be given unto you. The word shall. I learned this um, 
Dave, when we went, a bunch of us in our church, we got a threatening letter, an email from an idiot, crazy guy up in Ohio. We actually traced him down. We had the police go to his house and tell him to leave us alone. Because he had written several emails to our church. The first one was, I hope somebody comes in and blows your church all to pieces. Because he thought I was a false prophet. And uh, my wife read it. She took it seriously. And... Um, so we, we thought there was the possibility that, I mean, here's this loner guy, not married to anybody, that he, he could very well make a trip down here to Festus. We would never know who he is and come in here and shoot up the place because he accused me of teaching false doctrine. And um, so I called the Festus City Police and they called his local municipality. And they said, yeah, he's done this before with different preachers. We'll go out and talk to him. That normally calms him down a little bit. But they went out to the man's house to tell him, look, here's, here's the email that you sent to this church. Why are you saying that you hope God sends somebody into their church to blow them all to bits? And after that, we kind of got a little nervous. And there was about, what, a dozen of us, something like that. They all got our concealed carry permits at the same time under the same instructor and uh, he was really good and he told us that in our church as long as the governing body allows certain members to carry a concealed weapon in the church they have every right to inside that church to protect the people of that church somebody say amen, amen. we actually have a greater weapon than that Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. He didn't say you might. I might let you have it. I might show it to you. There are questions that I've asked God years ago that I've not gotten an answer to yet. There are questions that I've asked God that within the afternoon I got answers to it. And I always liked those. But in every case, he said, For um, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that act knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Uh, or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children... How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and it ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He does not use the word maybe here. He does not use the word here that if you qualify enough. He does not use the, the phrase here that if you have enough righteous deeds in your life, that God will do these things. In fact, I think, in fact, look up here for a minute. I believe that the number one hindrance to most of the prayers that you've prayed has been because... You do not believe that you yourself are worthy of God answering the prayer for you. Am I right on that? Especially when you're reading things out of the Psalms. And you know that you violated God's word. You violated his commandments. And yet here you are asking for God's blessings. And there's something telling you, maybe it's a devil or whatever it is, telling you, you will not get these blessings. You might as well quit asking. They're not for you because you know what you've done. But let me tell you this. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Somebody say amen. And I want to tell you something. If you are in Christ, God will deny you no good thing. So the key, I guess, if you wanted to title this, the key to prayer is two things. Number one, it's waiting on the Lord. 
waiting on his timing and his way of doing things and his plan that he has all laid out it is waiting on the Lord. And the second part, which we won't get to today, is trusting while you're waiting. And I will be the first to admit to everybody here this morning that there have been times when I have struggled with the two things that I'm going to preach to you today. So I'm not just preaching out of my vast Bible college seminary training that they read in a book somewhere. I'm telling you my own experience in life that there are things that I prayed for that God answered right away. There are things that I prayed for that God said, Mike, I'm going to make you wait for the answer to that prayer. But rest assured, the answer is coming. And I will do that which I have sworn to do. If you'll ask me, I'll give. If you'll seek, then I'll make sure you find. If you knock, then I will make sure it is open unto you. And then he, I, I, I'm going to read this part again. Uh, what man, verse 9, what man is there of you, if, if, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good things unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven, who is not evil, give good things unto them that ask him. Therefore in all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even, even unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. So I'm going to read a few verses to you this morning, uh, just sort of as an introduction to the message. The, the idea of waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. We're living in a day right now where in, information, we complain if our internet speed is only 100 megabits per second. And yet I go back to the days where you couldn't even download graphics on your computer. It would take all day you were lucky to get text on your computer from AOL or CompuServe or whatever those things were back, back in the 80s. Back in the 80s is what I'm talking about. But now we've gotten used to having instantaneous access to information, instantaneous access to people's phone numbers, instantaneous access to people around that we know through their cell phones or their tablets. We've got to reach them somehow. And if, we don't, and if we don't reach them within five minutes, we think the worst. Oh my goodness, they're all dead laying in a ditch somewhere. It's, oh, it's terrible. And we tend to think that way. But one of the things that God is going to teach us, He's going to teach us patience so that we learn that if we ask God to do something, He will do it. But He'll do it in His time. And in His way. You can, amen. You can open your Bibles up to Psalms. I'm going to read through some of these Psalms. They've got beautiful verses in them. On waiting on the Lord. I want to move through these kind of fast because this is kind of the introductory. And then, then I'm going to finish it up with this. The first time the Lord appeared to Gideon, whom he used to deliver the children of Israel... From the hand of, I think it was the Midianites. God used him in a mighty, mighty way. But Gideon was a man sort of like me. Did God really say that? Did God really intend that for me? Is God really going to do and keep his promises that he made to me? Or is God going to find a reason to get out of it some way? Uh, and that's Gideon. And Gideon ran a test on God to see and to make sure that this angel that he was talking to was truly God. And I'm going to show this to you. First of all, Psalm 25, verse 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation, and on thee do I wait all the day 
And I'm telling you people, we are always a byproduct of our culture and our civilization, no matter how we fight against it. It always in, infects us and interacts with us in ways that it usually don't turn out good. Now, I don't know if you noticed or not, but since COVID, all these ref, restaurants are not letting anybody in, but they don't mind you ordering through their drive throughs And I will say, McDonald's is probably one of the best about getting you in and out of their drive through and they handle probably thousands of people at each store every single day. So they don't, you don't have to actually wait that long. But if you go to other places uh, where they don't have such fast systems for getting food out. And I won't mention some of them town because some people work from this church work at those places. But they don't get them out too fast and we don't like to wait for them. This is what we've turned to into this country. Since we get instant uh, downloads of information from the internet, since we get higher and higher speeds on our mobile device, since we get all of this and all of that, and we can tap into any resource anywhere in the world just about at any time, we have lost the ability to wait on the good things. So he said, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. If God had something for you, would it not be worth it for you to wait all day for it, for God to give it to you? Psalm 25, 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Let me tell you how to apply this now in prayer. You prayed. And number one, believe that when you pray, God did hear your prayer. And you can come up with all these things. Well, you know, I'm a sinner and I've done this and I've committed horrible mistakes and I've done bad things. But let me tell you, if you're in Christ, God's going to answer the prayer. Amen. You are in Christ. Christ is in you. When God sees you, he sees the only begotten of the Father, and the Father is not going to deny the Son anything that he asked. Now, I don't know what would have happened had Jesus actually done this, but Jesus made the statement when they came to arrest him. He said, do you not understand that I could call now to my Father and he could send ten, uh, ten legions of angels? Or was it ten or ten thousand? It was a lot. And run all of you guys off here so you can't touch me. Apparently Jesus had that kind of power with his father. And his father would not have denied him for it. But in that he would have been disobedient. To what God actually wanted Christ to do. God actually wanted to, Christ to go through the sufferings of the cross. So that we could obtain our everlasting salvation through Christ's sufferings. And aren't you glad that Jesus waited till the end of the day. Amen. But he made this statement, I can call on my father and he'll send ten thousands of his angels down here and take care of all you. But thank God, God didn't do that. Psalm twenty-seven, fourteen: wait on the Lord, be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. You prayed the prayer. Now you're in the waiting process and the devil's going to be right here like a mosquito in your ear at, at night. Buzzing to you, telling you, well, where's your answer? God's not going to give it to you. God's not going to tell you. God's not going to answer your prayer. You're too rotten sinful. You don't deserve anything. But that's not true. Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Psalm 37, 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Does not God will to teach us patience? Patiently. Um, Psalm 40 verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me. And heard my cry. And again. How much less of a sinner was David. Than any of us here. He was the same kind of sinner that you and I are. 
And yet he prayed to God. And God heard him. He did it in his time. But God inclined his ear unto David and heard his cry. Because David waited patiently for the Lord. I was told during the years I was down at Richwoods, Missouri. And Richwoods is, if you think you live in the country, go to Richwoods. In fact, there was a joke that they told me down there. This old boy was, he lived way out there in the sticks in Ridgewoods. And the insurance agent called him one day and said, Sir, I need to come out and visit with you for a while on your policy and some things. And he told him, he said, I'm just calling to make sure I know the directions to your house. And he did. Well, there was a mix up there and the insurance man was going to come out. Like on a Tuesday, but the guy thought he was coming out the next Tuesday. Him and his family decided to go on vacation. So the man leaves his office there in DeSoto and he drives out H Highway, gets all the way out to Rich Woods. And then he's told to watch for this dirt road. Well, there's only 50,000 dirt roads in Rich Woods. He finds the right one, gets on this dirt road, goes out way out in the middle of the woods on top of this hill for a while. The dirt road then turns into an old logging road. And after a while, the logs have covered the road. He had to get out of his car and walk deep into the woods. And he finally gets to this clearing. And I, I know a house just like this. Part this. You can tell some of this stuff I'm making up. But I actually know a house just like this. A guy built his house out there in the middle of nowhere in Richwoods. And he called an electric company to hook up electricity. And they said, we can't run a pole out there. So the guy built him a great big old windmill. To generate power, put solar panels on his roof. He put his water tanks in his, in his rafters, in his attic. So during the day, the sunlight would heat up his wash water. And at night, he would have plenty of warm water to wash him and his family with. And that's how he lived out there. He said, fine, you're not going to give me electricity. It means I don't owe a bill. The insurance guy gets out to this house. He's having to walk a mile through the woods, gets to the clearing, gets to this house, gets ready to knock on the door, and he sees a note on there. The guy rolling in there says, Dear Mr. Insurance Man, gone to the country. Be back Tuesday. <laughs> Where do you go to the country when you live out there? I don't remember what that had to do with the sermon, but it was pretty good. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and he heard my cry. Psalm 69 verse 6. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord. Now listen to this. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be, be confounded for my sake, O God of my, O God of Israel. In other words, you prayed a prayer, and you prayed it publicly, and you told everybody you know, family members, uh, co-workers that know you go to church, they don't like you for that, and they're just looking for some flaw in your life, and you've been praying and praying and praying for something to work in somebody's life or for God to do some big miracle. You're praying for them all the time, and it just seems like it takes forever. Now they're going to mock you. They're going to scorn you. They're going to call you names. Because you prayed to your God and they're now saying, where is your God? The heathen, the lost people are looking for opportunities to mock you and to scold you with their words. Because they don't believe in your God. They don't want to believe in your God. Let me tell you what they're really afraid of. They're really afraid that the miracle will actually happen. And it will cause them to change how they think about God. And so the prayer is, let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Let them that not, that wait on thee, O Lord of hosts, be a, uh, let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. In other words, God, I'm waiting for the answer. You can do it, whatever you want. But God, when you do it, I want you to make sure that they see it. Amen. Psalm 20, verse 22. Say not thou, I will re recompense evil, but wait on the Lord and he shall save thee. So that guy that you're mad at, that woman that you're mad at, your next door neighbor that you're mad at, because their dog got out and tore up your garden. 
My dad had almost got into it with a neighbor. He had dogs. Dad decided he was going to raise chickens one year. The dogs got in and killed every one of those chickens out of that pen. And it made dad mad, hurt his feelings. He's got his dad, now don't, just let God handle it. And I believe you're better off when you let, if you'll wait on God, you'll pray and wait on God, then let God do it for you. I believe you'd be better off. Say, somebody say amen. Isaiah 25, 9, it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him. He will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Who in this church has been saved now for 20 years or more? Raise your hand. 25 years or more? Raise your hand. 30 years or more? Raise your hand. 35 years or more? Raise your hand. 40 years? 50 years? We're kind of running out. But what you did, Brother George, you asked God 50 years ago to save you so that when you die, you don't have to go to hell. What you did was you had God pay for you an insurance policy that never wears out. That at the time of your death, God says, I will give you riches in glory because you trusted in me. And it was a prayer you prayed 50 years ago. As far as I'm concerned, we don't, I don't believe we, the Bible tells us we have to ask people every Sunday to ask God to save them all over again. Do we? They ask God to save them. God saves them. God said he will keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. If you put it in God's hands, God still got it and he's going to do something about it. Amen. Now, uh, Isaiah chapter 40. This is a well-known passage, but I want you to understand the context of it. What comes before it? That might help you understand it a little bit. You know this part that says, They that wait on the Lord shall renew themselves, with, shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not faint and so on. Look at the, re, look at the context of that. We go to Isaiah 40 and we have to go back to verse 28 in that passage. And God says this, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, Fainteth not, neither, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. In other words, God doesn't take time off because he needs the rest. God, God doesn't say to us now, all next week, I don't want anybody praying because I'm going to go on vacation. He doesn't say that. The creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Verse 29. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. And that's to all of you out there, both here and those listening online, who have sin issues in your life. You know they're there, you hate them, you don't want them there anymore. You want God to deliver you from them, because you've tried to deliver yourself. You cannot deliver yourself. It's not in you, it's not in your strength, it's not in your power. You know if God doesn't deliver you, then you're going to be sunk. And you don't want to continue on in sin. You want God to do it. So he says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator, the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is wither, and there's, there's searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. Those of you who are about ready to give up, if you are chained to the chariot of Jesus Christ, if you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't believe that God will let you faint and fall out. I believe he'll carry you. So verse 30, even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fail. They had a a lantern release last Wednesday after Taylor's funeral. They all got out on the Hillsboro football field. And I stayed in the car up on the hill. I was going to film it from up above. Next thing I know, there's four teenagers running down the football field. Fast as they could go. Caleb swears he was the one that beat them all every time. But even the youth get tired, don't they? 
But they, verse 31, that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles and they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. And what did he say was the remedy for it? He said, waiting on it. Has God given you your wings yet? No. Wait for it. Because won't it be worth it? Won't it be worth it? Isaiah 64. Turn there. Oh, I like this. Because Paul quotes this verse. Isaiah 64, 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye has seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Have you ever tried to imagine what heaven's like? Using the description given to us in our Bible. Don't follow the world in that. Don't say, hey, boy, it's going to be unlimited cheeseburgers. I wouldn't believe in that stuff. But follow the Bible on it. And I'm telling you that heaven is a glorious place. It is a wonderful place. It is a place of comfort. It is a place of eternal rest. It is a place where we will have no more sorrow, no more tears, no more being hurt and destroyed and defamed and, and put down by other people. There'll be no wars up there. There'll be no crying up there. There'll be no heartache up there. There will be everlasting joy for all of eternity. But he said you're going to wait on it. Is it worth waiting for? Then any prayer that you pray down here is equally worth waiting for. For God to do it. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 24. The Lord is my portion. Saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope. And quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. I remember what I was going to say a while ago. Being out in Richwoods. There's a lot of Pentecostal churches out there. And some of them are pretty out there. I guess it's a rule that the farther you're out in the country as a church, the weirder you can be because nobody knows where you are and you can just do whatever you want. And a man I knew down there went to, they got, he got invited to one of the services and a couple minutes before the service starts, some guy starts beating on the drums. Some guy starts playing on the guitar. And I'm talking about a, a old time Pentecostal church. And what they're doing, they were using the beat of the drums and the rhythm of the guitars to get everybody up moving. Dancing before the Lord. And then all of a sudden, several of them began to run around the sanctuary fast as they could. And he asked, he said, what are they doing? Oh, they're bringing in the Holy Spirit. We're running in the Holy Ghost. We're bringing him down to us. Can you show me that anywhere in the Bible? In fact, in fact. Fact. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 1. On the day of the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon mankind, there was no dancing. There was no prancing. There was no running. There were, they didn't have a drummer going boom, 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 boom. And the guitar going. Nothing like that. That's pretty good, wouldn't it? You know what Jesus said? You want that Holy Ghost that I've been promising you? He said, this is what you do. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But what? Wait. Wait. 
In fact, don't do anything. Don't do anything. You know why? Because I think Jesus was saying, I don't want you to teach man that they can bring down my Holy Ghost from heaven. When my Holy Spirit decides to descend and give you power, that's on him and not you. He told him to wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And it happened exactly what the, all they'd had to do was wait. God didn't say start running. God didn't start say playing drums. He didn't say play guitars. He didn't say we got to go out and tell everybody we're going to have a big party here. There's going to be this and that and the other. He didn't. He just told him. He said, you just go there and wait. Now. Have I made my case so far? You pray to prayer. And I'm telling you. If it's worth it to you, if it's that important to you, let's say that you have a brother, or you have a sister, a kinfolk, or you still have a mom and dad that's not saved. You go to God and call upon the name of the Lord and petition God on their behalf. Giving your supplications before God. Begging God to heal them and to bring them to salvation. And then you know what you do? Wait. Don't try to get ahead of God. Don't try to do it for Him. Because He doesn't need your help. He can do it. Did He not save you? All on his own by himself. Now turn to Judges chapter six, and I'm going to teach you how I'm going to teach you how God works. I read this one day, and I just I got so excited I had to call a preacher friend, as brother Mike Hutzel, I think, and share with him what I had found in God's word, and he agreed with me. Judges chapter 6, this is the story of Gideon. Remember Gideon's army, 300 men? That God told Gideon, whittle, whittle it down, kick out some of these guys. I know you called them, but I didn't call them. They're not right. And I only need 300 men. So let's just use 300 against the entire army of the Moabites. So Judges chapter 6, this is the first time God ever calls Gideon. And all Gideon was doing at the time, the Bible says there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Ebiezrite and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. You see the Midianites had taken control over the Israelites, which means that they stole their crops. And here Gideon, realizing that the Midianites would have stolen the wheat that he had grown for his family to feed his family for a year. If I don't harvest this and get this in away from the Philistines, they're going to steal it from me and my family's going to starve to death. And let me tell you something, if it's worth it to you, I got a man right now who's been in contact with me. And he hasn't told me what's been going on, but I'm detecting that there's problems in his marriage. And what he told me he's going to do, he said, I'm going, to I'm going to fast and pray for three days. And I told him how I had fasted and prayed for this ministry. And I said, I'm not saying that you have to do it exactly the way I did it, but do it something similar to that. But if it's, listen, if it's worth it, if you would like to keep your marriage together, if you'd like for God to bless you and your wife, if there's any sin in your life or her life, God will expose it. God will bring it out. God will cause godly sorrow to come into that person. They will repent. There will be forgiveness and God will put a marriage back together that the world says there's not a chance that they can be saved. God can save that family. But here's Gideon. There came an angel of the Lord, and I believe that's Christ. 
and sat under an oak which was in Oprah that, contained, that pertained unto Joash the Ebiezrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Because the Midianites would have found him threshing wheat, they would have come and stole the wheat. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, let me ask you this question. What had Gideon done prior to this calling that qualified him to be the captain of the army of Israel? What had Gideon done? Does anybody know? According to your Bible, not a doggone thing. God just picked him. God knew something about this man's heart that he was somebody that he could work with, somebody that he could teach, somebody that would trust him when the going got rough. So, verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now, does that phrase that Gideon just told God, does that constitute as praise or complaint? Complaint. And let me tell you, there's been more than one time when I've complained to God about how things turned out. God, I didn't want it to be this way. God, will you fix it back or God, will you make it better? But I don't want it this way. You can ask God that and he'll do it. So we find out Gideon is actually nothing. In fact, he says that here in a little bit. And he says, um, oh, midway through verse 13, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. He's a little angry at God. Now, God did this to Israel because they had it coming. They turned their back on God and God was doing it because that's what they had coming. Verse 14, and the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherefore shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. In other words, Father, we're not, Lord, we're not the Rothschilds. We're not the Bilderbergs. We're not of the Trilateral Commission. We don't have billions of dollars. How is it in God that you can pick the, four, the poorest family among the Israelites and I'm the last son in the family. I'm the run of the litter. How is it that you can pick me? Same reason why God took the army of Gideon that was in the thousands and said, Gideon, you got too many men in your army. We're going to bring it down to 300 because I want it known that when we win this war, I want it known that I won the war, not you. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. They're never going to sing that and replace God's name with to John be the glory, great. Never going to happen, is it, John? Melissa won't allow it. Now look at verse 16 or verse 15. He said unto him, O Lord, wherewith shall I serve Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with him. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come with thee, and thou bring forth and, and, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. Now let me set this up for you and tell him what he's doing. Gideon is a man who constantly needs reassurance. And that's me. I preached about Gideon years ago. Um, and I called it the eternal insecurity of Gideon. 
Gideon was always looking for a sign that God was telling the truth. That was the whole thing about the fleeces that he laid out. We'll get into that later, not today. That was the whole thing about the fleeces that he laid out before the Lord. He, he wanted to make sure it was God. He, 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 just didn't, he just didn't have it in him to just trust that. And so he says to the Lord, Lord, tarry here while I go and bring you a present. Now let me see if I can remember this right. Uh, it's not it's not the old rugged cross. It is rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. In in my hand, no price I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Now let me ask you a question. What gift can you offer to God that would cause Him to answer your prayer? Now I'm going to prove it to you. I read this one day and I went, that blows me away. So let's look at it. Look in verse 19. Gideon went in and made ready a kid. And it could be one of yours. If you want to, you're willing to offer up one of your kids, go ahead. And made ready a kid. Gideon went and killed. And he didn't have a lot of these. They're a poor family. He made ready a kid. He sacrificed him. Skinned him. Took the meat. Cut it up. Roasted it. Put it in, in broth and broiled it. And took un, made unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot. Because you never throw away the broth. Amen, ladies? Never throw away. If you, if you put a chicken in a pot, don't throw that broth away. That's good stuff. Now watch this. He put the broth in a pot and brought it under the him under the oak and presented it. So he's got, he's got the meat in a basket. He's got the broth in a pot and he comes up to the angel of the Lord now to offer his gifts unto the Lord. I'm going to see if the Lord accepts these my gifts. By the way, those of you who are Catholic, you will remember that prayer from the Catholic Mass that they make you pray. That the, the wafers that are up on the stage, they represent your wafers and you're giving them to God and you, the priest is asking God to accept these, thy gifts from us, which is a joke. Is there anything that you think God needs that you can present to God that he will then accept and give you a blessing back? No! He owns it! So watch this. The angel, verse 20, the angel of God said unto him, take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock. So he took the unleavened cakes and the flesh and he put them on that rock. And then he said, pour out the broth. And he did so. Now what good does pouring out the broth do? Where's that broth now? Gone. Did the angel even go, Oh, that's, that's good. Did he do that? He said, dump it out. And then, in verse 21, Then the angel of the Lord put forth the edge of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Now there's nothing left of the bread and the meat that he brought. Nothing. So did God accept Gideon's gift? But did God still do what he promised 
he would do with Gideon. Yes. And see, that was the test. When you look at now and uh, he consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes, then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom, which is God, our peace, unto this day yet is in Oprah and the Abbey Ezraites. Gideon then knew right then that he was dealing with the true God because the true God doesn't need your gifts to answer your prayers. In fact, there's nothing to offer him. God even said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The truth of it is, people, is that you pray, you ask God, and then wait. And I could tell you story after story of the times that I tried to intervene for God. To make sure it went the way I wanted it to go, Gary. And God showed me, Mike, that was so dangerous what you did. I almost didn't bless you because of that. But I'm going to go ahead and give you better than what you asked for. Because I love you. That's the kind of God I am. And it was at that point that Gideon knew he was dealing with the real God. And God was going to do what he asked. Let's bow our heads.